Greetings to everybody online and welcome to this pre-event in support of the United Nations Food Systems Summit of 2021. My name is Professor Lindue Majele Sibanda and I'll be your moderator for this exciting session where we have been brought on board by three key organizations that are keen on making sure that we get our food systems right. We have the LIB for FNSSA that provides support for European and African institutions to enhance their engagement in joint research and innovation on food and nutrition security and sustainable agriculture. We have Forum, which is a consortium of 129 universities operating in 38 countries spanning the African continent. The forum's mission is to strengthen the capacities of universities so that they foster innovations and are responsive to demands of smallholder farmers. And then we have AFAD, which is an umbrella network of European research and non-research stakeholders from public and private European organizations and the European Commission. EFAD's aim is to strengthen the contribution of European agriculture research for development. Welcome, Hello. colleagues, to this exciting session. The name of our session is Working Together for Resilient Food Systems Towards a Europe-Africa Platform for Research and Innovation. In this session, we are particularly focusing on working together for resilient food systems. We are all aware that COVID-19 has shown the fragility of our food systems. It has made us aware of the interrelatedness of the different parts and scales of the systems. We expect that in the future, we are going to experience more shocks. These may be in the form of natural disasters, conflict, diseases, all that have devastating consequences for vulnerable populations. The ambition of Action Track 5 is to ensure that food systems are able to deliver food security, that food systems are able to deliver nutrition and equitable livelihoods for all despite all these crises. We therefore need to find solutions and all actors in the food systems need to work together from farmers to consumers, from policymakers to companies, researchers, social workers, school teachers. In this session, we will focus on how, how can research and innovation work in cooperation with the different actors within the food systems? How can they bring about transformation towards more resilience? Therefore, the goal of our session is to explore the perspectives of different stakeholders within the food systems on resilience pathways and how new ways of collaboration in the field of research and innovation should look like. I have some key questions that I'll be posing to our panelists. But before we go to our panel, we're going to have a high level welcome address, none other, by the number one at the forum, Professor Adipala. And then we're going to have an introduction to what do we mean by food systems and what does resilience mean? This will be delivered by Professor Caron. And then I will have six panelists who will respond to questions that I will pose as your moderator. That's in brief uh, an outline of the session that we are going to be having over the next one and a half hours. Without further ado, I would like to call upon Professor Adipala to give us the opening remarks. Over to you, Prof Adipala. Professor Lindiwe, all participants, ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed a great honor for Forum to be part of the conveners of this event. 
allow me at the onset to recognize the presence of Honorable Minister Cooper, the Minister of, Agric of Agriculture from the, the Republic of Liberia. Honorable Minister, thank you for coming for this meeting and thank you for being there for Africa. Dr. Hans Diog Nusefa, the Scientific Officer, Director of Research and Innovation at the European Commission, thank you for being part of this event. Professor Patrick Caron, the Vice President of the University of Montpellier, thank you not only for being part of this event, but thank you for your university working very closely with African institutions. Caroline, project, the project manager by Innovate Zimbabwe, great to have you in this meeting. Mr. Anthony Mungavin, the Vice President of Food and Refreshment Africa, Unilever, we're really happy to have you. We really would like to hear the voice of the private sector. Mr. Hakin Blaraine, the chairperson of the Eastern and Southern African Small Farmers Forum. Your perspective is very, very important for moving forward the agenda of food and nutritional security. Mr. Samuel Rigu, the founder and CEO of Safari Organics, we are delighted to have you here as one of African young innovators. It will be very great to hear your perspective. Our moderator, Lindue, it's always great to have you around and it's really a great honor for you to moderate this meeting. All participants, ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed a great pleasure for me to participate on the, in this high level event on working together for resilient food systems towards a Europe Africa platform for research and innovation. For those who may not be familiar with the forum, we are a network of 129 universities in 38 African countries, founded in 2004 by vice chancellors from initially 10 universities in Eastern and Southern Africa. Our focus is to support transformation of African universities to collaboratively train critical thinkers, generate entrepreneurial graduates, and generate technologies and knowledge and innovations that are relevant in addressing Africa's agricultural development challenges and reaching out to communities to solve these challenges. We recognize that we cannot do this alone. So the forum works very, very closely to foster global partnerships to support the transformation of the agricultural sectors. Today, Africa and Europe are facing unprecedented challenge of COVID-19, which has negative, negatively affected our food systems for which our collaborative role is very much needed. COVID came in to the continent, which was to our continent, Africa, which was already facing divest devastating impact of climate change, such as drought, floods, pests, and diseases. Africa in particular was previously affected by log locust innovations, increasing pressure on land from increasing population, declining soil fertility with high level of post-harvest losses and limited, uh, limited addition, value addition in our agricultural produce. The continent also faces very poor food distribution and this is contributing to widespread geographical hunger across the continent especially in the Sahel and in the Horn of Africa, as well as hidden anger from the less nutritious food. During the, this COVID-19 pandemic, most human activities came to a standstill, but food was still needed and is still needed. Food is life. Agricultural activities across the food systems were inevitably, must inevitably continue against all risks 
because both the sick and the healthy need to eat. Ladies and gentlemen, it is thus important for us players in the research and innovation systems to give our heart, soul, and energy to generate solutions through knowledge, technology, and innovations to challenges that affect our food systems. We therefore need to dedicate all our efforts to generate new knowledge that enable production, management of better management of post-harvest handling, value addition, marketing, and effective <laughs> distribution of food to all humanity. It is indeed true that Africa is blessed with good climate and water and has potential to produce adequate food to feed the world. And together working with Europe, our closest neighbor in the research and innovation, we will be able to jointly address all the bottleneck, bottlenecks to address the issues of food insecurity and improved nutrition in our continent. Europe and Africa have a vast number of skilled and innovative human resources who need to be mobilized to deploy research and innovation capacity, entrepreneurship, and appropriate policies to eliminate bottlenecks such as impact of climate change, land de degradation, post-harvest losses, less nutrition as food, and poor food distribution. <laughs> the Africa-Europe Partnership for Research and Innovation in the Food and Nutritional Security is an excellent platform to mobilize all actors in Africa and Europe to effectively engage in this effort. As a network of, of African universities, we pledge to mobilize African researchers from not only just universities, but also research institutions and other development actors, to, including vocational institutions, to generate new knowledge, generate new technologies, and to start enterprises, enterprises where we work with farmers and other actors in the food systems to ensure that the bottleneck in the food systems are addressed. We pledge to continue to strengthen our partnership with Agrinatura so that we harness the expertise from both Europe and Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, I plead for support from the African Union Commission, from the European Commission, and from our member states to make this dream a reality. No, thank you very much for your participation in this event. And I wish all of us a fruitful deliberation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Adipala, and thank you for that clarion call. We hear you loud and clear. The anchor institutions are the African Union and the European Commission, and you are bringing everything that Africa has to this fold to make sure that you can deliver on your mission. Thank you very much and very much in line with sustainable development goal number 17, which is all about partnerships. No one institution can deliver on their own. We need win-win partnerships. Now, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, allow me now to dig deep into the subject of the day. We all need an introduction to understand food systems resilience. We have with us Professor Dr. Patrick Caron, who is the Vice President of the University of Montpellier and a member of the scientific group advising on the preparation of the United Nations Secretary General's Food Systems Summit of 2021. He's going to speak to us on food systems, 
resilience, the role of the summit, the challenges for resilience and the link to our cooperation. Over to you, Patrick. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, dear Lindy. Many thanks, Professor Radipala, for your energy. I'm so happy to meet you all, although I would have preferred a, a true meeting, honorable ministers and, and, and dear colleagues. Many thanks to the LIP for FNSSA project for Ruforum and EFON for this invitation and for giving us a chance to discuss the important issue of strengthening partnership between Africa and Europe and of building common intelligence and capacity to address both specific and global concerns. We already knew that something was going wrong with our food systems. These systems are not broken since the huge majority of us can access very diverse food and in sufficient quantity every day. Yet the persistence of hunger for 10% of the world population and the dramatic rise of obesity make malnutrition the number one problem in public health. In addition, food systems are at the heart of major threats, more and more effects related to climate change, biodiversity erosion, removal of resources, in particular soil and water, health-related concern, social injustice, and political instability. Our house is burning, despite the incredible growth that has paved the road for the last decades. And the list of threats is long. And the COVID crisis resonates like a detonator, which is certainly preluding cascading crises. We knew it, but time has come to change our world to make sure that our grandchildren may have a decent living. Five years ago, the approval of the Agenda 2030 with its 17 Sustainable Development Goals resonated like an impossible utopia for most. We now know that we have to take it seriously, that we have to face the obstacles that prevent making this dream a reality. We know that food system transformation is at the heart of such a move because of its many complex connections with other factors. It is not just to address food security issues that remain a priority objective, but also to act upon food system as a lever for the profound transformation that is required. This is why the announcement of a food system summit by the UN Secretary General in 2021 as part of the decade of action to achieve the sustainable development goals is an excellent news. You all notice that is not only about food or food security, it is about food systems. The summit ambitions to awaken the world to the fact that we all must work together, transform the way the world produces, consumes, and thinks about food. Rebuilding the food systems will also enable us to answer the UN Secretary General's call to build back better from COVID-19. Scientists agree that transforming our food systems is among the most powerful ways to make progress towards all 17 SDGs. A scientific group made of 29 scientists has been created which demonstrates the fundamental role of science to grasp the complexity of the challenge ahead of us. The scientific group is in particular expected to provide evidence to support the design of actions within five action tracks. With the mobilization of the scientific communities, the role of science goes thus beyond the mere provision of evidence. It is also expected to highlight the different possible pathways to be designed as knowledge is incomplete and the context uncertain. Because of force in crisis, we all know that resilience will be a key asset and this force science to engage in foresight. We prepare the summit dialogues 
will be implemented uh, to uh, the design of food system transformation to prepare, sorry, to prepare the summit, the, the, the dialogues will be implemented at different scales. And scientific approaches should help us understanding and moving beyond obstacles for change, whether related to risk management, to past dependency, to trade off and wasted interest or conflicts of interest. This is what we will be discussing in Montpellier in the next February, in next February, when we organize a science policy reflection as a way to value the results of the International Scientific Conference on Global Food Security that is taking place from 4 to 9th of December. Science will finally be key to contribute to the preparation of the next generation in order to better seize and understand what is at stake and to shape a new world. This begins with education. We should engage in a huge movement that forces us to experiment, to test, to learn, to adapt, to be audacious, and in the same time, humble and modest. Our future relies on you, the young generation, if some of you listen to us. It will rely on your skills, on your capacity, on your engagement to design the future. The cascading crisis that hits and will hit us is dramatic. At the same time, it offers a unique opportunity to shape a new world. I would like to share three related convictions with you very briefly. The first one is that the future of our world will be written in Africa. This is not even a prophecy. It is easy to foresee. Because of the intense demographic and economic transitions, because of the current vulnerability of the population, because of the intense connections of the rest of the world. I could take many examples. My second conviction is the acknowledgement that we should move from research for developments towards development through research, as shared with my colleagues from CIRAD and the University of Montpellier. Research capacity should be looked at as a driver and an engine for development. Research should be key to contribute to the capacity to design adapted and specific transformation pathways within a society as one size fits all solutions will provide limited answers. The transfer of exogenous technologies designed in the best world labs remains essential as illustrated with the COVID vaccine. But this has to go along with the strengthening of the local, national, and regional research capacities. My third convictions refer to the importance of partnership, as you highlighted in the way. It is essential to contribute to the strengthening of research capacities in all regions in the world. It is also key to address issue of global concerns. And we will not address those concerns with gaps in knowledge in some regions in the world, nor the capacity to generate this knowledge. And this is why the Europe-Africa partnership in research and innovation is so important. This is also why it's food and security, food security and nutrition focus is so relevant. This should not be a revival of the traditional aid paradigm. This should aim at jointly addressing issues of common interest for the two continents and for their population. This should not be a research program for African food security and agriculture supported by Europe. Easy to say, not easy to make it a reality. It appears as obvious when it comes to global concepts, such as climate change or pandemics, or to processes that connect the two continents, such as impact of trade or migration. But this is not enough, and we should better think about common approaches and steps to work together towards resilient food systems. 
I'm quite sure that Europe has also to, le to learn a lot from Africa, for example, to become more resilient. I I'm convinced that we have to learn by thinking and working together. Let's design the future food systems together by identifying priorities of common interest and bold actions for food as a force for goods. Let's change the world together. Dear Lindy Wei, I wish that the discussion will now contribute to this ambition. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Patrick Caron, for unpacking for us what food systems resilience is all about. What I take away from your remarks is that number one, we have to build back better. That's what resilience is about. Number two, we need science that provides foresight. Number three, the hub of all this cannot be anywhere else except in Africa. So this Europe-Africa partnership is going to be key in providing education on what we need to do, what we need to know, and how we position ourselves to bounce back better. Thank you very much for that overview. And I don't want to take away too much because our panelists will further unpack your keynote address, but also speak to the issue of partnerships, which Professor Adipala so eloquently addressed. Allow me, Excellencies, to now dig deep into our panel. We have a very rich panel of six, and I want to start by taking us to Liberia. We are honored to have with us the Minister of Agriculture, Honorable Janine Milly Cooper. She has vast experience of what her country is doing, the challenges they are facing in the area of food systems resilience, and the transformations and policies and the partnerships they need to put together, but more particularly the role of universities and their partnerships within Ruforum. Welcome, Honorable Minister. Thank you very much, Professor Sibanda. <clears throat> Thank you. Could you take us to Liberia and help <laughs> us understand in the context of resilient food systems. What exactly are you putting in place for Liberia to bounce back better? You've gone through a lot, you went through Ebola, now it's COVID. How do you prepare to never go down but be better than what you were before all these calamities? Over to you, Honorable Minister Cooper. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Sibanda, and uh, thank you very much to the organizers for uh, once more thinking of me to, to have these discussions with you. Um, Professor Adipala, uh, Professor Zina, um, Professor uh, Lutzier, and Professor Caron, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, please allow me to observe all uh, standing protocols uh, for greeting. As I said, it's, it's a pleasure for me uh, to be here once again and to, to share some of not only my thoughts, but also um, what we are doing and what we are facing in Liberia um, uh, on um, food security and, and resilience. Um, for the, for the, like, Many other countries in, in, in Africa, Liberia is an agriculture dependent country with up to 70% of our population relying on agriculture for food and for livelihoods. Um, our principal crops, of course, are um, rubber, cassava, rice, oil palm, cocoa, sugarcane, coffee to a lesser extent, um, horticulture, and then we have major uh, uh, potential, emerging potential, re-emerging potential, let me say, in uh, fisheries and uh, uh, livestock. Um, after 
World War II, if I take you back a little bit, when the country began its, its development trajectory, the focus was on tree crops mainly. Mainly rubber um, was the, 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 the foundation of our agricultural development and our economic development in the country. Um, even today, rubber is still one of the dominant generators of state revenue. It, it constitutes about 13% of our GDP in 2019. But over the decades, of course, the, 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 the focus has changed in Liberia um, to, to prioritize food crops uh, more. And um, in, in Liberia, what does this mean? We have emerging, or they emerged some time ago, uh, the tension between urban consumers and rural food producers. Um, the challenge has been to develop food systems that satisfy both sets of interests. How can we address the fact that up to three quarters of all of our farmers live in poverty which is the major cause of insecurity. So that has been our challenge and our focus uh, in Liberia. Now, emerging from the war, uh, 2004, five, the focus, uh, we put more focus on boosting agricultural productivity and putting in the agricultural infrastructure and necessary policies, putting those in place. We are heavily food import, uh, dependent country, uh, probably 70% of, of, of what we consume uh, is imported. And while food imports remain high, we have seen as a result of those investments that we have made in agricultural infrastructure, in policy development, in boosting productivity, productivity we've seen a year on year reduction in the amount of food that we produce. And this has been particularly evident over the last three years in the post uh, Ebola period. And while food production measurements uh, are the way that we assess uh, how much we are actually producing in the country, um, the fact that we have a growing population um, and a reduction in imports of, of food implies that we do have an, uh, a con um, uh, 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 an increase in local production. We've not seen any alarming food insecurity uh, figures. Uh, what food security we have here is not acute. Um, and so that means we're doing something right. So our current challenge is to do more of what is working, to do it better and to do it sustainably. Um, and as we... <clears throat> As we began, just began to re realize some of the gains in agricultural production from our investments, mainly since Ebola, the COVID-19 pandemic engulfed us. And this was a wake up call for us because we're still heavily dependent on food imports and the global supply chains were retracting and contracting and shifting um, in, in um, unpredictable ways. Um, so for us, the food systems approach, where we look at everything from farm to fork, from seed to plate, yeah. um, uh, um, uh, um, <clears throat> that was important. But it's also more important for Liberia because of our status as a high forest cover country. So for environmental reasons and sustainability reasons, we have over 40% of the Upper Guinea forest is in Liberia. Wow. Um, uh, um, Liberia is what is called a carbon sink. So we yeah. sequester we sequester of over 70 million metric tons of carbon every year here in Liberia. We're also a biodiversity hotspot. So while we want to in, in, increase our production, we have to look at how can we do it in, 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 in ways that does not detract from our environmental priorities, from our uh, forest um, uh, uh, and, 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 and um, uh, cover? Yeah. And, and so we're looking at, yeah, do I have to stop? 
No, no, I'm just impressed by the fact that uh, Liberia has always gotten it right. I know several women ministers who've held that portfolio of Minister of Agriculture. Congratulations, Liberia. And no wonder you are making headway on food security and uh, you are food secure and you have reduced your import bill. I just wanted to zero in, Honorable Minister, on the role of universities. You are a key yeah. member of Reforum. You are very clear on your call to improve productivity. What would you say that uh, universities and networks such as Reforum should be bringing or are already bringing to make you achieve your aspirations? Well, <clears throat> as we shift, as we shift our, our, our um, situation looking at sustainable agriculture moving beyond just productivity boosts and looking at how we can commercialize and 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 intensify our cultivation how can we process what we eat more of what we eat so we don't have to import it process and export it uh, raw um, we're looking to the universities to 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 shift with us to 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 help us to apply the research that has been done Mm -hmm. to focus the research on, on what is relevant for us, particularly given, as I said, our high forest cover. How can we do that sustainably, um, intensify production sustainably? How can we commercialize? And you know, knowing that our universities here in Liberia, they can't do it all for us. So networks such as Rue Forum and, and the platforms that you invite us to um, expand our knowledge base. And then we're looking to learn from others, particularly our, our partners in the more industrialized countries. How did they make that transition from agricultural production to agricultural industrialization? Um, yes. Yeah, so as uh, Professor Patrick Caron put it, it's about education. It's about learning from each other. And as yeah. you rightfully say, you look to the North, you look to the South, it's horizontal, it's vertical. We want knowledge that will position us to bounce back better. And well done, congratulations, Honorable Minister Mili Cooper. You are on the right track. And we are on an education platform and as Minister of Agriculture, you're in the forefront to say knowledge is key for you to achieve your aspirations of increased productivity and resilience. And the carbon sink is definitely working in your favor and the biodiversity. Well done, Liberia. Let me uh, Professor Sibanda. Yes, Mona, I, I just please. wanted to add one one last point. Please and go that ahead. is that this year Liberia is named one of two member state representatives from Africa on the advisory committee for the UN Food Systems Summit in 2021. So Liberia and Morocco are the African representatives. So the, the dialogue and, and networking opportunities that, that you're presenting here are things that we're going to be looking at to lead and do more of um, as we move towards the summit. Congratulations. I cannot stop being proud of being African and being proud of having Liberia carry the torch together with Morocco for us because you definitely have a lot to offer and lessons that you can bring to the rest of Africa. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister, for highlighting and the inclusion within the UN Food Systems Summit, where you are our ambassadors. Thank you very much. Allow me, Excellencies, to cross over to the European Commission. As Professor Adipala said, they need the Commission, the European Commission, they need the African Union. We have with us Dr. Hans Jog, Lutea, who is a senior research program officer in the European Commission, DG European Commission Office. Sir, you are here with us. Can you tell us about this partnership? What keeps you awake about the partnership and what would you like to see happening better? Over to you. Thank you, uh, Professor Sibanda, uh, dear excellencies, colleagues and participants. Uh, good morning to everybody. And as you can see in Brussels at the European Commission, we are still sitting in our home offices. 
Yep. But the lockdown actually is paying off. So daily infection rates in Belgium are uh, heavily decreasing. So from around 18,000 per day, I think to around 2,000. So we are looking forward actually uh, to a positive change in life, uh, maybe even before the vaccine is available uh, to all of us. Yeah, thank you uh, for your um, uh, questions and also congratulations uh, to the organizers uh, to be such a front runner in the UN Food System Summit uh, pre-events. I think it's a great opportunity um, which True Forum and Leap for FNSSA actually took uh, to build actually the the topics to build the stakeholder meetings in um, in view of the UN Food System Summit. Um, we will also build on that uh, in uh, Europe with a foresight conference uh, mid of December, and certainly uh, the partnership um, EU AU uh, for us um, is of major importance. I mean we are working along a 10-year roadmap, which we started in 2016, uh, a, a roadmap jointly agreed by the African Union and the European Union. And um, we continue to invest from both continents um, um, in building this uh, long-term partnership. And the partnership is on one hand, um, let's say based on institutions, so African Union, European Union, and also great to have WHO Forum here as an organizer. Probably we could do more to build the linkages with European universities, uh, but I see Wageningen and the UR, um, University of Hohenheim, CIRAT are present. And certainly with uh, projects which are supporting this long, uh, um, term partnership with many innovative ideas. So we Dr. have. Dr. Hans, you yeah. are saying you could do more. Can you unpack for me the more that you see where we are really not taking advantage and Reforum is listening, wanting to hear that directive of what is it that could be happening more to enhance the partnership and the engagement through Reforum and the European partners? Yeah, I think it's uh, something which we have to test uh, um, al along the way we are going. Uh, so, for example, we had a clustering event where we brought um, the projects we are funding under this partnership together uh, to work together. We are looking forward to a stakeholder event around the EU AU summit. These are all opportunities where we could work together. Now we are planning Horizon Europe um, with uh, partnership ideas, but partnerships ideas also in Europe. But there, I think we should also use opportunities uh, if we build networks of European universities uh, to link them up uh, with African universities, yeah. with Roof Forum. This is something actually on the agenda for the years to come. Excellent. So we are looking forward to more partnerships, coalitions within the European clusters who will then anchor onto Euroforum and expand the, the, the pie, which we are already enjoying from the partnership, but it has to do more. Thank you very much for those insights in terms of uh, what you see as the gaps in these partnerships and what you are pledging to be doing. And congratulations for your 10 year roadmap. We look forward to seeing the implementation and the outputs and outcomes from that roadmap. Thank you. Can um, I then, would you like to say something else? Yeah, maybe just uh, to uh, underline that we are also committed actually uh, to continue uh, funding in collaboration. So research, uh, opportunities, innovation opportunities, and currently we are planning along the Green Deal and also Farm to Fork, the major policy directions of the European Commission uh, to invest in the first go in Horizon Europe um, uh, to deepen agroecology understanding, 
to do more on innovations for plant health, um, also a one health approach uh, for, let's say, animal and uh, human uh, diseases. We will look into uh, overcoming malnutrition with scientific evidence, both um, over and under nutrition. And we know that food system change is starting with place-based innovations. So we are also strengthening, let's say, um, African food cities, innovations for African food cities and linking them to networks uh, of European food cities. Thank you, back to you. Thank you so much. That's an interesting addition because we've been talking about friend raising, the partnerships, but what you are bringing is the funding component, which will be very sweet music to Professor Adipala. Thank you for that commitment to increase the envelope, but also to look at issues of One Health, issues of feeding our cities and plant um, um, ecology and uh, health into the, the, the horizon. Thank you so much for that commitment to the African partnership and the envelope that you're bringing in. Colleagues, allow me to go to my hometown. We have project manager in civil society organization, bioinnovation with us, Ms. Carolyn Jacquet speaking with us from Zimbabwe. CSOs, what exactly yeah. is the role of civil society organizations in this food systems paradigm? Do they have a role? And can you bring us some success stories out of Zimbabwe uh, that will make us have hope that things are happening? Over to you. Ms. Caroline. Thank you, Professor Sibanda, and good morning to everyone. Um, so my name is Caroline. Um, I'm the project manager at Bio Innovation Zimbabwe, um, a Zimbabwean NGO, um, though we prefer to call ourselves a research trust. Um, and we work on commercializing um, underutilized plants and, and crops. So from what we do, you can probably already tell um, how we see um, more resilient uh, food systems. Um, we see them as being much more diverse and much more local than they currently are. Um, and with more local, I mean, based on traditional crops and indigenous plants and much less dependent on, on imports. Um, but, you know, the, the current food systems uh, we find are highly unsustainable both on the production sites, where we see a continuous decrease in, in, in production, and also on the food supply sites, you know, where we see a dominance of very poor diets. Um, I, I mean, in Zimbabwe, and, and I'm sure it's very similar in many other places, 90% of the diets, and so 90% of what's being produced and, and imported, um, comes from just four, and they're all foreign crops. So, you know, what, where we see our role or what we believe is that with some very small adjustments, we could make very big differences. And so we see our role as um, needing to broaden what people consider as food. Um, we need to promote diversity, we need to promote local. Um, and so at, at, at BIS, for example, um, we've selected a number of, of species to focus on. Um, and um, I'm talking small grains, I'm talking local legumes such as lumbar nuts, I'm talking um, indigenous fruits and vegetables, insects, um, and we've selected these species not based on their nutritional values or because they're healthy, even though of course they are, but because of their commercial potential. Because, you know, farmers, they don't want to just be self-sufficient, they want to be able to sell also. Um, and so that's where we see our role as, as bioinnovation, developing and facilitating the access to markets for local indigenous plants that allow households to diversify their production uh, base, to grow climate smart crops and, and to strengthen their resilience. Thank you very much. Carolyn, you speak about the crops, the insects and the markets and the income for farmers that you seek to increase. I have not heard university. Does the word university come into your vocabulary or totally, they are not totally. civil society? 
No, no, they are. And they are pro probably one of our biggest partners, because as you know, all these underutilized plants and crops, they're not very well researched. Um, so we do work very, very closely with um, especially local universities, but also universities in South Africa, because of course we need help. We need, we need help with, with um, you know, developing production um, practices. Uh, we need help with domestication often. Uh, we need help with product developments to access markets. Um, so yes, we, we work very, very closely with, with uh, local universities. What, what would you see in a network like Ruforum? You say you are working in Zimbabwe, you are working with South African, but Ruforum is bigger than all that. So what would you see the partnership or the expanded network bringing to the questions that you have and your aspirations? Well, because a lot of the crops and plants that we have in Zimbabwe are, of course, not um, found only in Zimbabwe, but they're found, you know, in the region and even in Africa. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot we can learn from from others, very obviously. Um, yeah. Okay, so it's so, the learning once again yeah, that Professor exactly. Patrick Caron brought. What you do the learning and the sharing, yeah, sharing with South Africa, sharing with Kenya, sharing with Tanzania, and sharing Africa wide and globally in yeah. terms of how do you bring these hidden, often crops, indigenous crops, into uh, the fore so that they enhance nutrition, security, but more important, increase the income of our mm -hmm. farmers. Exactly. Thank you so much, Carolyn, for sharing those experiences mm -hmm. from Zimbabwe. Colleagues, I encourage you to write on the chat. We've already received some questions. May we have a link to the recorded version of the webinar? I'm sure our secretariat will provide that. How do we increase the online farmer community, increasing intra-African farmer relationships? IT farmers are yearning for connectivity. And how do we integrate the university agricultural students to be part of these existing societies. There you are, Caroline. There you are, EC. There you are, Minister Liberia. There you are, private sector. Our students are looking for opportunities to be part of this bandwagon that is taking us to Food Systems Summit 2021 and beyond to ensure that Africa is food secure. Let me go back now to our panelists. We've heard from civil society. We want to go to private sector. Unilever, you are into big business. Big business and partnerships are key in what you do. What do these university partnerships do for you? What strategies do you have in place for bringing, like our students are saying online, opportunities for integration so that they are part of this private sector research and innovation movement. We have with us Mr. Anthony Moon Gavin, who is going to unpack what he is doing as Vice President of Food and Refreshment Africa at Unilever. Over to you, Anthony. Thank you, Professor Sabando. It's, uh, it's, it's wonderful to be here with you today. Um, uh, you know, I think at Unilever as a, as a consumer goods company, we're not directly uh, part of any RNI specific networks. Um, but what I will say is that we strongly believe that uh, public private collaboration and science and innovation are, are absolutely essential if we to make sustainable living you know, an everyday reality. I think the way that we at Unilever interface with the RNI agenda is, is similar to many other private sector companies who are not directly crop or, or life science companies. It's through research projects we specifically commission or driving a broader policy consensus through, through global partnerships and, and trade associations. Uh, some of those, ex some examples of, of those glo global partnerships are the, are the Food and Land Use Coalition, which, which we at Unilever helped found. We also sit on the World Economic Forum Food System Stewards Board and, and are a leading member of the WBCSD's Food and Nature Program, just a, a couple of examples. And I think these platforms you know, help set consensus on the issues that we need to collectively tackle uh, and, and are important specifically for, for the RNI uh, priorities. 
Uh, we do have some direct, some direct links, however. Uh, you know, for food and agriculture, we've recently invested a significant quantum in a, in a new state-of-the-art foods innovation center at Bacheningen uh, University, which, which we like to call the Silicon Valley of, of foods. Um, and we're particularly keen to build momentum on a flagship project called Future Foods from and for Africa scaling up what we call our future 50 foods which are underutilized healthy grains proteins vegetables which we believe could be locally grown and are better alternatives than, than some of our current crops and um, both for our health and and for the planet yeah yeah thank you so much unilever for sharing what uh, the silicon valley is doing but i i want to push the envelope you you've got the wagenigen investments here we are talking about Africa, we are talking about Reforum, we are talking about a lot of these indigenous crops and livestock sitting in Africa where we have the opportunity of what is called future foods, future foods. What do you see in the horizon and prospects where Reforum can say, yes, we have a friend in Unilever, let's go into business and partnership together. Anything in the horizon? A, a, a few things, but I, I guess at this point, it's, it, you know, from, from a private sector capacity, it's important to, to call and worth calling out that we're not an agriculture firm, right? So yes. as a consumer goods company, we specialize in, in the production and innovation of processed foods, you know, so whether that's fortified bullion cubes or soups or seasonings and the like. So our interest really is, is in buying dried and processed ingredients and understanding how we can use them to make affordable and nutritious food for, for the growing urban population across Africa. Um, but maybe just to say that uh, the agenda is no longer just agriculture and Professor Adepala and Professor Absolutely. Patrick Caron is from farm to fork. So yeah. we are really sitting in the center of what you do where it's mm -hmm. value addition. So what are the opportunities for Africa in direct partnerships with private sector? Yeah. What do you see? So I think developing this is, of course, going to require significant research, innovation, partnerships. Yeah. Um, but crucially, I think what, what we also see is a big need on to, to, to focus on areas that are further upstream. So whether that's processing, logistics, consumer awareness, and, and critically affordability. So, you know, Africa is urbanizing quickly. And so yeah. R&I priorities need to understand the consumer perspective in, in future direction. And, and, and I guess my big appeal is that we ensure that all the work we collectively do is, is, is truly demand-led um, yeah. and, and, and that the, our consumers are, are, are at, the, at, the, at the forefront of that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I bet what I'm really looking for is a Silicon Valley for Africa. Is there anything, any way we can learn from what Vakanihan in your partnership is doing and take advantage of the Europe-Africa partnership yeah. to build our own Silicon Valley of food in Africa. Well, so one of the, one of the pilot projects out of, out of that uh, investment and that project is, is what we are calling Future Foods for and from Africa. And, and, and it's, it's a, you know, an innovation program and roadmap that, that we're running and, and looking for partners uh, to, to really build that future 50 food program across the continent and um, across the, the full value chain. Uh, and, and that's only started in the last few months and, and we're hoping to build significant momentum with that. Can we help you find the partners because we have them in our pocket and Professor Adipala is listening. Would love that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anthony. That's where I was pushing you to. It's SDG 17 and we want to bounce back better we want to think outside the box. We want to learn from those who've already been doing this, but we don't want to leave anyone behind. And I'm yeah. sure what you've unpacked for us is a stimulus for you, us to further engage and see how best we can actualize our dream. Minister Janine Mili Cooper is also listening. She was going to bring on board Morocco as well. We want to see a Silicon Valley of foods for Africa in our continent and Absolutely. with a partner and, like and I think Partnership innovation is truly one of the ways that we're going to do that moving forward. Thank you so much. One stakeholder category that is looking for these partnerships are our farmers. We may talk about farm to fork, but the key word is the alphabet A, where we start, and that's the farm. 
We've got with us the chairperson of ESAF, the Eastern and Southern Africa Small Scale Farmers Forum, Mr. Hakim Balrain. You're coming here to share the perspective of what SMEs like you, who are farmers, who are private sector in your own right, are looking for partnerships for research and innovation with people like Unilever, but also beyond Unilever. Can you share your perspectives on the collaborations on research and innovation for private companies that you foresee and you need for your work as a farmer to be actualized? Over to you, Mr. Hakim. Mr. Hakim, can you hear us? Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Over to you, sir. I've been having a network program because I'm far in a, in a, in a upland, upcountry. I'm Hakim Badiraine, as already introduced, and the National Chairperson of Eastern and South Africa Small Scale Farmers Forum, which is a network of, gra of grassroots small scale farmers organization working in 16 countries of Eastern and Southern Africa region, including South Sudan, Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, Kenya, Tanzania, Swaziland, Zambia, Zimbabwe, Malawi, South Africa, the source of DRC, Madagascar, Seychelles, and Mozambique. The movement, which started in 2002 during the World Summit on Sustainable Development in Johannesburg, South Africa, is a small scale farmers initiated farmer led and farmer owned. Its purpose is to enable small scale farmers in Eastern and Southern Africa to speak as a united voice. Go ahead, I'm Mr. Here. Hakim. Are you hearing me? Yes, very clear. Please go ahead. Okay, I was worried that my internet is cutting off and on. Its purpose is to enable small scale farmers in Eastern and Southern Africa to speak as a united voice so that issues and concerns and recommendations become an integral part of policies and practices at national, regional, and international level. Uh, a small background, global hunger is steadily on, on the rise. And as food and, and uh, agriculture organization, state of food security and nutrition in the world, 2020 report estimates that 690 million in the world are hungry. 90% of the world hungry can be found in two regions. Five out of 10 live in Asia, while nearly four out of 10 are in Africa. However, Africa has the fastest growing hunger rate among all regions, and Africa is projected to overtake Asia in 10 years. 430 million undernourished by 2030. In Southern Africa, nearly 45 million people are food insecure, mainly the rural people. This is a shocking increase of 67% since, since 2017, and up to 10% from that last year, when 41 million people were facing food insecurity ionically, the, when the Malabo is five years away and 20, in 2025 and the sustainable development goal in 2030. It is from this background that we need a food system, which can be a reality to overcome these challenges of hunger in the world. Our perspective as small scale farmers A collaboration with the research and innovation company is paramount in that it bridges the gap between these in, inter entities and builds synergies. Farmers' innovation stand the higher chances of being tested, tried, and approved very quickly as compared to going it alone. Implementation, implementation, implementation of research agendas, which are participatory, yields more and quicker results as it were as it when a research or company introduced to farm introduced farmers when they had finalized their research. It widens the experiences which these parties have and hence adoption becomes easier. At this period, when, when we are faced with multiple challenges, small scale farmers need more collaboration, networking, institution, networking with institutions, companies, and research organizations if we need to have food systems which we, which we desire. Some of the challenges which, we, which, which, which we've been facing one of them is climate change, and this one uh, it brings in which is which brings in drought, flood, pests like follow armyworm, desert locust, 
diseases and other natural calamities. And their increase affects most mosquito farmers, especially in Africa, and maybe in other developing continents. And now COVID-19 has changed everything. Our interaction is limited. Some countries still coming to get some some countries still coming together is not allowed. So break down the systems of sharing new new ideas. Farmers' interests are not all are not always the same as of, 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 of some companies, and this creates a conflict of interest in some cases. Fund, funding of research institutions, especially government owned, owned, is still inadequate, and this gives a leeway for stronger international organizations to influence what type of research can be done since they have enough funds. On many occasions, mosquito farmers' innovation goes unnoticed, as many research institutions doubt their ability, technical know how, and as the credibility of what we do. Yes, yeah, Mr. Hakim. I'm now giving the examples, maybe as I conclude. Yeah, I think I need the examples so that we can then dig deep into those in our discussion. Yes, yes, Thank yes. You. Thank you very much, Madam. Uh, for example, ESAF, we implemented the, the EU multi-stakeholders funded inside project in 2012, which, which aimed at including smallholder farmers in research and development and resulted into support supporting farmers in, in Bayer to work with the Research Institute, Institute of Uyole to purify farmers' maize cultivars, as known as Ibandwe. Muyuvata, based in Tanzania, one of the members of ESAF are working with Sokoina University and other research institutes in Tanzania on various research agendas, which are directly going to benefit farmers and the university itself. ESAF is also closely working with the forum in finding solutions to challenges facing small scale farmers and research, which, and, 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 and reform has conducted, which reform has also conducted and they shared recently. SF Uganda is implementing a project of ecological organic culture initiative funded by, by SDC through Biovision Trust, and they are working on collaboration with Uganda Matters University, who, conduct, who are conducting research on how to grow crops like coffee, pineapple, tomato, cabbage without using inorganic pesticides. SF Uganda is also working with research institutions while establishing farmer field schools, which have a number of varieties of seed livestock, which later can be upscaled, like rice, peanuts, and soya bean maize, to mention but a few. Uh, so, so research and innovation is a cornerstone for any health resilient food system, but should be based, should be based on, should be based and built on the small scale farmers' knowledge and experience. As we have many years of experience, research should appreciate indigenous knowledge. Small scale farmers, especially women and youth, should be involved in research, planning, implementation, monitoring, and utilization of knowledge, and not be recipient of knowledge at the end. Dissemination of technologies and publications should be in a simple language, pictorial to enable farmers understand the easily and utilize innovation. Uh, some of our policy recommendations, we, we believe that public and private sector funding should be increased to the agricultural sector as per the Malabo goal of 10%, as well as increased funding to the agricultural research and innovation. Indicators number six under Malabo on increasing the resilience among farmers should should top the agenda in policy planning and funding. Farmers yes. should remain at the heart of the research and innovation and should be involved from the planning stages. Revitalizing rural development strategy and make rural communities as centers for innovation, production, and processing of nutritious and healthy food based on our political principles. Thank in my you. conclusion, I would say that another food system is possible. That's agroecology. It has it has a time, it has a test through this time. It has stood test of time. It is tried, resilient to a number of stress and shocks, especially related to climate change and its effect. Thank you for giving us opportunity from SF Uganda as a small scale farmer. Thank you so much, Mr. Hakim, for sharing the challenges that you face and top when that list is climate change. But already you are committing to learning. You've got partnerships that are international that are helping you to share experiences and learn. But most important, you are highlighting that your national agriculture research institutions are compromised, they are weak. So partnerships are key in strengthening the knowledge exchange and we should never leave the farmers behind because they have the indigenous knowledge, they have the experience and they are partners in research and innovation. Message well said and received. Thank you very much, Mr. Hakim. Let me move That's over nice. now 
to Uganda, to Kenya. Mr. Samuel Rigu, who is the founder and CEO of Safi Organics in Kenya, he wants to share with us the role that SMEs are playing in addressing food systems resilience. And I'm sure there are some success stories out of Kenya that we have. Over to you for five minutes, Mr. Samuel Rigu. All standing protocols observed. Good afternoon. I'm Samuel Rigu, the co-founder of Safi Organics. And in Safi Organics, what we do, we decentralize fertilizer production, making it possible for the bulk of fertilizers to be produced in local villages and farmers get it when they need it. Uh, SMEs, we cannot ignore the role of SMEs in the food systems because over 90% of all enterprises are SMEs. And these SMEs provide 70% of employment across the value chain. But interestingly, 94% of SMEs were really hit hard by COVID-19, mm. which means that our food systems have been affected uh, in a very great scale by COVID-19. However, uh, just to tell our story as Safi Organics, uh, we have seen, despite the fact that our sales reduced by up to 40% uh, due to the fact that our market, which was uh, relying, part of it was relying on export, uh, it happened that because we were not exporting, then uh, some of our farmers had to first uh, scale down their production, which led to us being affected in terms of the production. But one of the things that we saw is the fact that because we are producing locally, uh, farmers were in a position still to access our, our fertilizers for them to use in their farm uh, when they needed it. So this, uh, this tells us if in most cases, we can have our SMEs decentralizing to local production uh, majorly, not everything, but major of it, then we will have a chance to produce throughout and also to reach our market, which is local, uh, to reach it much, much faster uh, when we have disruptions. So uh, looking at Safi Organics, we have had partnership with uh, several universities across uh, both in Kenya and also in the US. And one of the things, as well as in UK, uh, one of the things that we have seen is that the universities come in key in terms of shaping uh, the product or uh, shaping the efficiency of the product. However, uh, we also understand that in the light of what the universities are doing, there is a key need to have commercializing agents. All SMEs become commercializing agents for the research that is being done in the university. Because much of that is done yeah, in research work, but when it comes to commercialization, there is a very big, big gap that needs to be filled. And uh, what all my idea would be if we can have uh, the university um, uh, being in the forefront in commercializing of uh, whatever the researches that are there in the university uh, in regard to food systems, then definitely we would have more problem being solved across the, con uh, the continent. So, and this can be done basically uh, by the students who are at the university, as well as in partnership with SMEs that are already established. So uh, when there is a key alignment of uh, the vision uh, for the SME and the research that want to be commercialized, then there can be a partnership. And through that, uh, definitely we'll have more uh, and be in a position to produce more in terms of uh, food uh, for the 9 billion people who are expected to yes. be here by 2050. Mr. Samuel Rigu, I just want to find out from you, 
you are already in business. Safi Organics is uh, led by research, I want to say, and innovation. How did you coin that partnership? How did you benefit from uh, research and innovation? And how would you help us understand that model where you say you need innovation hubs within universities where students are already involved and they graduate into a workspace where they run with their own companies? Can you just take us to the origins of the company that you co-founded? Well, uh, when we were two of us and uh, we were looking into energy actually. So uh, previously we were into energy. And one of the things that we were looking at uh, during that time, there was a ban on charcoal in Kenya. So we were looking at producing briquettes uh, sustainably here in Kenya. So uh, we partnered with a student in MIT. Uh, so that way, now the student, uh, all our agreement was, what I'll do uh, on the ground is to commercialize uh, the briquettes while he works on a technology that can, uh, can come up with briquettes much faster. So, but along the way uh, with our residues, which was rice as then didn't work. So what happened is using my agricultural background, I decided to venture into uh, fertilizers uh, using the same uh, technology. So at that point, now the university was very key in the development of this uh, technology of conversion of uh, raw materials or crop residues into biochem. So through that, we were able to develop a prototype uh, for that work. And now what we are currently doing is actually commercializing the, pro uh, the prototype uh, now from uh, the, the side of the research, now we are bringing it into business. And we believe this uh, will actually change. It has taken long than, uh, longer than we anticipated because uh, we had anticipated that by around 2018, we would have gone commercial, but uh, the research took a bit longer. So currently is the time now we are commercializing the technology. Excellent, thank you so much. I think many youth are keen to learn from you and to follow in your footsteps and congratulations. That's what Africa needs. Young, vibrant entrepreneurs who are informed by research and innovate to solve our biggest challenge of food insecurity, but most important, resilient food systems. Thank you so much, Samuel, for that experience. Thank you Allow so much. Me excellencies to call upon uh, Dr. Philip, who is going to provide us with a summary of what we've heard and where we are going from here. He is the research and strategy deputy director for the French Agriculture Research Center for International Development, CIRAD, and also the coordinator of the LIB for FNSSA program. Over to you, Dr. Philip. Thank you, Professor Sibanda. I, I think it would not be uh, fair to say that I can summarize such a very rich discussion and with many ideas, but I, I'll try to do my best. And, and I think what I've noticed is, is probably there are four key issues. The first one is obviously uh, move toward a resilient and sustainable food system is a challenge and is a challenge for Europe and is a challenge for Africa and it's a challenge for the world. I think that was we agreed on that. But to overcome this challenge, we need knowledge, we need research, we need innovation, we need education. I mean, those words have come many, many times. And these are key for the transformation process, which move, will help us move towards resilience and sustainability. And when I talk about research, innovation, knowledge, I think we have plenty of example, including local knowledge, including working on, on local food, I mean, I just want to open a small parenthesis. Maybe some participants from West Africa, they know about the Fonio, this small cereal, which in fact was not very much used, but thanks to lifting up a bottleneck about the, the dehusking of Fonio, now it's a value chain that pro provides income for farmers and it's a very rich, nutritious food. It's a key example. I mean, our colleague from Unilever was saying, this is food for and from Africa. 
thanks to a small innovation in, in the Haskin small machineries. I think there are plenty of examples of that type. So, so we need to focus on these. I think the third idea that came quite strongly is, yes, there is an added value for Europe and Africa to work together on those issues. I like the word that someone said, we, we, we learn from each other and each continent learn from the other continent. Um, so joint actions, uh, and that could, could be, so it led to the partnership, which is uh, approved by both European Union and African Union, but beyond the policy uh, dimension, it leads to actions on the ground, joint action. And I think Dr. Adi Pala in his opening speech mentioned the platform, which is supporting this partnership and making it concrete actions on the ground. So I think we need to, to work on this uh, platform. And my fourth and, and probably final comment would, would be that for this platform to be efficient, for this partnership to be efficient and partnership, which is not an aid program, but really, I like the word also, alignment of visions. Yes, we align visions. Challenges, both have challenges. Circumstances may be different, but we have to have a, uh, an alignment of visions and work together. But key to this is going to be both continents need to be on board and all stakeholders on board. I think that was very strongly uh, uh, mentioned, especially by our colleagues from the farmers, CSO, SMEs. And I would like also to say consumers, um, uh, the representative of Unilever also mentioned consumers. They have to be on board in this process of mobilizing research, innovation, and, and knowledge. Um, and in the end, um, I'm quite hopeful because uh, Dr. Adipala from Reform said, yes, we are here to help and we can, we can channel a lot of information coming from uh, uh, a lot of places in, in Africa. He also mentioned his linkage with Agrinatura, mobilizing the knowledge on the European side. There were examples from uh, Samuel Rigu saying a small SME is also working with partners locally, but also internationally. So a lot is, is happening. A lot of institutions are willing to, to help. Um, um, the Eastern African Farmer Forum can also provide a lot of uh, engagement with actors on the ground. So all this makes me quite hopeful. Not only we have uh, a lot of ideas and contribution for the UN Food Summit, which is one of the output of that, this discussion, but also we have a lot of food for thought and actions to be implemented for building up a platform that we have been talking about uh, to work multi-stakeholder platform, working with the EU and the support of the EU. I mean, Hans Jokic, I also mentioned this engagement of the EU and uh, Horizon Europe to continue supporting this partnership. So let's let's all work together and build up this platform. And I and I and I think we we can look forward to a, a brighter future with more resilience and more sustainable food systems. Thank you so much, Dr. Philippe, for giving us hope. As we started off in this session, we were looking for bold actions for food as a force for good. And it's clear that we are taking bold actions. We are committing to making things happen. And we have a message to take to the UN Food Systems Summit of 2021. Maybe just a quick recap of where we started from. We were looking at what transformations are required to make value chains more resilient. We had a word from our farmers. We had a word from our SMEs. We had a word from big business on some of the transformations. And the key word there was don't leave the farmer behind, build innovation hubs at our universities and create centers, our Silicon Valleys of Africa and Europe that will exchange knowledge and provide foresight into how we can bounce back better. We also ask the question of what is the role of research and innovation in contributing towards action track five? And Dr. Philip, you've just said it well, that we need each other, we need research and we need investments in this research. And how does the research arena, the research, the funding agencies, the programs, inter international collaboration, what needs to change to be in a better position to strengthen the food system's resilience. Partnerships, education, foresight, and funding. 
what could be the role of a sustainable bioregional Africa, Europe research and innovation platform in addressing food systems resilience? And what are the responses to shocks and challenges? Our farmer was clear, climate change is the biggest challenge they are facing. Our honorable minister in Liberia was clear, Africa needs to be food secure and increase productivity. Now, what do we need? We need these partnerships. And Professor Patrick Caron said, Africa is the hub. So Europe, here we come, here we call, let's strengthen this partnership for us to deliver. What mechanisms should we put in place to ensure the research outputs reach the intended users and are used to guide food systems, policy making and development. Ruforum, you are operating in all these countries. You are generating the knowledge, right from pure research to policy research. We have messengers, we have ministers, we have the country of Liberia, we have Morocco. We have messengers and we have a platform, the Food Systems Summit of 2021. Let's have the evidence generated by our research. Let's have the champions, our messengers who will carry our message and let's march forward to Food Systems UN 2021 and make sure post 2021, our food systems are resilient and we bounce back better forever. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's been a pleasure being your moderator. I'm speaking with you from the University of Pretoria, where I hold the chair of professor and director of the Alliance for Research Universities in Africa. Thank you to our partners who've been the conveners of this session. Thank you to those online who have sent their questions on chat. We will make sure this session is recorded and available through our secretariat. Many thanks to our panelists who've been awesome in sharing their experiences. And thank you for that introductory remark from Professor Adipala and the keynote address by Professor Patrick Caron. Thank you for the closing remarks and summary and the excellent job in capturing the lessons and the way forward by Dr. Philip. Over to everybody. Thank you, that brings us to the end. And thank you to the excellent secretariat who made sure they support us. Wasim and Tim, you've been awesome. Thank you very much. This is the end of our session. Thank you to the investor of Wakanihan and all the other collaborators and conveners who've made this possible. Thank you.